All right. So did we all watch the uh, super weird and crazy Nickelodeon documentary that's out now on Max called Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV? I did. I subjected myself to the four almost hour long episodes that completely and utterly ruined my childhood, but that is nowhere near as horrible as the ruining of the childhoods of many of the child stars that were featured on said documentary. This whole thing has been making the rounds. It's going mega viral. You're hearing the names Brian Peck, Jason Handy, Dan Schneider, all names that we've are seemingly familiar with, but the stories are getting far more detailed in this new docu-series. We're going to unpack each of the four episodes today, have a conversation with you guys about what you learned and just broad broader ideas and things that we can draw from what we've now learned about what was happening behind the scenes. But before we get into that, we have Taylor in Nashville. Hey, yeah, it's kind of traumatizing watching all that be unpacked in the documentary, but I suppose we can all kind of process that in our collective childhoods together. And are you wearing the orange top out of solidarity for the child stars or is that just a coincidence that I just noticed that? (laughs) That is in fact a coincidence. Y'all, I'm not repping Nickelodeon Orange right now. (laughs) We are not repping Nickelodeon on this channel today. So uh, do not come for me for that. Now, uh, for those of you who are unaware and have not heard of this documentary, again, it's called Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. And it focuses specifically on Nickelodeon, a ton of the child stars there, the work environment that was sort of set in place at Nickelodeon at the time, uh, around things like all that, the Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, These are all probably very familiar kids shows that you all have at least heard of, if not watched. Every single one of these Nick shows I was heavily invested in as a child. If I was home and I was able to watch TV, your girl was watching Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and Disney Channel. And of course, getting all the subliminal messaging that is present in these shows without even realizing it. Now, every time I go back and watch a Nickelodeon show from the past, I start to recognize just how inappropriate some of the jokes and script writing were in these shows. Most recently, I decided to log on to Netflix because they had Victorious, a couple seasons of Victorious on Netflix. I started watching through the episodes and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, now that I'm an adult, do I really understand the jokes that are being made here? And some would argue that these are just sort of Easter eggs that adults place in kids shows to make it watchable for all ages. But these ones were way out of line. We're going to get into that conversation. But first, let's talk about Quiet on Set, the docuseries, and go through each of the episodes and what we learn. Again, I'm going to try to give you as much information as possible. I can only pack so much into this podcast, though. I do recommend that you go and watch the docuseries if you're interested in it. And I'm going to start by saying I have my qualms with this docu-series and we're gonna get through it. You guys know that I analyze like culture and media and entertainment to see if there's any agenda present in what we're watching. And unfortunately I did recognize a little bit of that in this docu-series uh, and I don't think this docu-series knew what it was. It covers so many different topics of varying extremism, really, and it's really hard to get a complete through line of everything that they are trying to show you because they pick so many different topics and complaints to make about Nickelodeon, the general environment, the things that they're alleging happened while kids were working at this place, and we'll get there. But episode one starts out with sort of setting the scene for the workplace environment at Nickelodeon, specifically surrounding The Amanda Show. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, The Amanda Show starred Amanda Bynes, who was a very famous child star that sort of fell off the rails. Now, Amanda Bynes is not personally featured in this docuseries. She does not get interviewed. But I will remind you that in the past, Amanda Bynes took to the internet to let people know that she had become pregnant by a boss that she was working with at the age of 13. And I believe ended up aborting that child. She stated that she had undergone a lot of abuse, that there was issues with the money that she was uh, earning as a child star and uh, people taking advantage of her in that way. So Amanda Bynes has set her piece uh, and just was not featured in this specific documentary. Now they get into inappropriate jokes that are written into the show and we springboard off of that to talk about sort of the writer's room at the time. And here's qualm number one. 
that I have uh, with this docu-series. In episode one, we meet two female writers that worked on the Amanda show, and they start talking about this sort of patriarchal environment that was created by allegedly none other than Dan Schneider. You're gonna hear the word allegedly a lot when I'm doing this podcast episode, even though it seems as though a lot of this is credible and backed up, and there's some really big media companies talking about it. Your girl made a video about Dan Schneider in the past. And it went out on this channel, and some of you saw it, and we immediately received a cease and desist order. Now, this is at the time I was working at PragerU, uh, and then we had to, w w through like not much choice of our own, got rid of that video. So if you saw it at the time, you saw it at the time. But it's alleged that Dan Schneider created a hostile work environment specifically for female employees. Now, these two female writers talk about how difficult it was to even get their place within the industry and how they felt the need to obtain and, and stay in that position as women. Now, you guys know how I feel about that. I think we need to take a little bit of you know personal accountability. I can understand that it probably would be uh, seldom that you see a female in a writer's room in Hollywood at the time, but it did feel to me when I was watching episode one that there was something else going on. And I remember asking myself, like, why are they focusing so much on how hard it was to be a woman in the room and how these women really wanted to be there and they had to fight for their jobs and they had to deal with these inappropriate jokes? One could say it's to set the scene and to start painting a picture of what a hostile work environment looks like. And the hostile work environment it was allegedly created by none other than Dan Snyder. They talk about him pranking his employees, him telling inappropriate jokes, him making inappropriate bets. At one point, he told a female employee, I'll pay you a sum of money if you sit and eat two pints of ice cream. She did exactly that and alleges that she never received payment from Dan Snyder. All of this sort of paints a picture of what it was like working at Nickelodeon. But I'm hearing some of these stories and thinking, you didn't have to do that thing that he asked you to do. You, you could have spoken up, although they allege that they were not in the place to speak back to Dan, that they would have, you know, received poor treatment from him, possibly been fired. So always take that into account as well. But the thought occurred to me. It's interesting that you're featuring only the female writers. There's no male writers here to talk about the hostile work environment that Dan created. You're pushing this narrative of patriarchy. And I thought, OK, if there's so many inappropriate jokes being told at Disney, it's being written into the show, they're probably gonna bring women forward because if you're women present there and you're watching this happen to children, where were you? Why didn't you say anything? And they have to sort of set the scene for this hostile work environment where nobody can speak up. And throughout this documentary, you are going to hear so many instances of parents, workers, uh, production assistants, people behind the camera, all of whom are adults, both male and female, who watch these instances of hostile work environments being created, inappropriate situations being created, inappropriate scenes being written, inappropriate things being done to both children and staff, and nobody does anything. Complacency is such a huge part of the storyline that we're seeing here. So much so that when me and Taylor first talked about this documentary, we were like, there are so many people who did nothing about the situation being created. Yeah, and it's kind of like a missed opportunity thematically from the people who made the documentary because it did kind of seem like they had a specific way that they wanted to tell this story that really emphasized, like, in, in my mind, the, the biggest criticism of how it was made was that it kind of externalizes the issue to, or, or localizes it just in the power structure, this, okay, these powerful white men were in control of everything and intimidating everybody. And there's, to be fair, a lot of truth to that. And, you know, obviously the people who have the most blame uh, in a situation that is like a toxic work environment is the the people at the top or in a situation where a predator is allowed on a set or something like that. Like mm -hmm. the, it's the, the higher ups that bear the most responsibility. But I think what's lost is sort of the like self-examination angle of how many people saw things but did not say anything because they stood to lose something from the the child actors themselves to camera operators you hear from to editors to uh, directors on set etc they they were fully aware of a lot of these uh, issues that were happening but they had all kind of succumbed to the pressure of that environment and that's a, that's not even me necessarily like 
I mean, in some cases, it's crazy. And you're like, how could you not stand up to this? But I do sympathize with if you're in an environment where, hey, you're living your dream job, uh, you have this huge opportunity in front of you, that really makes it feel a lot more costly to stand up against the powers that be uh, when bad things are being allowed to happen. But I think that uh, what is unfortunate about the documentary is it seems to emphasize only that the bad, powerful people are to blame. And that's all we should think about and not uh, that we should also think about in ourselves. Like, have I had an opportunity that allowed me to uh, allow more uh, bad things to happen than I normally would, that I'd laugh at jokes that maybe I shouldn't have, that I'd indulge things I wouldn't, I should probably shouldn't indulge because I, I stood to gain something from it. And I think that that's more of like a, a human self-reflective sort of angle that, that was pretty much totally missed. And so there's, there's the layer of their responsibility to it. And then there's also the layer of like, we're all humans and susceptible to that kind of thing that I think the documentary didn't really explore. Yeah, a hundred percent. It doesn't get into that at all. I don't think many, uh, if any of the adults really take accountability for what happened in their own role in it, we will get to the very few who did and pay them their dues on that because it's really unfortunate to have heard all these things. And you know what? I, I do empathize with the women who say I was in a really stressful situation. I felt like like I needed to do what Dan wanted me to do. And that was the jokes. And that was the inappropriate behavior in the office. And that was playing along with the bets and the pranks. But my goodness, it's it's wild to watch a, a vast group of adults and have nobody do anything about the situation that's being created. So episode one sort of ends after setting the tone for the hostile work environment and these two female writers, writers detailing what they went through allegedly at the hands of, of Dan Schneider, they file a discrimination suit uh, against uh, Nickelodeon uh, detailing the discrimination that they feel they purposefully endured because they are women and that discrimination suit was settled out of court. So that was Dan Schneider's real first introduction on the Amanda show, and it ended with a discrimination lawsuit from two female writers that was settled out of court. So you'll see, the episode one really kind of alludes to inappropriate things, talks about what happened to these two female writers, uh, very basically lays the foundation for inappropriate writing for the kids' shows and what these child actors had to endure, but we're not getting too deep. They're really just setting the scene. Episode two, starts off with just an absolutely insane story. And that's where we hear the name Jason Handy. And this is Jason Handy here. If you guys want to take a look, he was a production assistant at Nickelodeon. And as you can see, that is a, a mugshot because Jason Handy does end up being arrested. Now, a young girl by the name of Brandy, she's given no last name in the documentary, wants to be in a Nickelodeon show, specifically the Amanda show. She is taken on uh, as a minor and as an extra on the show. And I believe she does one episode where she stars in the show. She's really excited about it. Her mother's really excited about it. And during that process, she meets a production assistant by the name Jason Handy. Now, her and Jason Handy exchange information and Jason starts emailing her. Again, this is a grown ass man, production assistant, emailing a little minor. Now, apparently the mother thinks nothing of this at the time. She's somewhat accommodated with Jason. Nice guy. She's looking over her daughter's emails with this older man, and they're seemingly innocuous. He's not really saying anything that would perk your ears up or, or make any red flags be drawn in your brain. Now, one day, Brandy gets an email from Jason. She shuts the computer. She's in tears. She leaves and goes to her room, and the mom comes and confronts her daughter. She takes a look at the email, and Jason has sent her daughter a nude photo whilst touching himself. Uh, on her email. You would think that a mother who's in this situation would immediately pick up the phone and call the police, not just for your own daughter's safety and for what your own daughter has just endured, which is abuse at the hands of an older man, but for the fact that he's a production assistant on a Nickelodeon set who is going to constantly be around other children. And they have this solo interview with the mother. Brandy's not featured in this docu-series. And she ends up saying, I can't call the police. I decided that I can't call the police. I didn't want to do this to my daughter. And I didn't want her to be blamed for whatever happens afterward. I don't know about y'all. 
And I don't know if this is going to come off rude or, or victim blamey or something like that. But how could you not, as a mother in the situation, watching your child go through this, immediately call the police for the sake of your own child and for the sake of every single other child that this grown man is around in his daily life working as a production assistant in Nickelodeon. But the police aren't called. Later, Jason Handy is investigated. They find out that he has 10,000 photos of children engaged in various activities, and they end up contacting Brandy's and Brandy's mom. And this guy had little baggies that he would keep of little keepsakes of the children that he would abuse. And he had one for Brandy. And that's how they found out about her. So the mom gets the bomb dropped on her that not only did this guy abuse your daughter, which she knew, but a ton of other kids, possibly thousands, given the cornucopia of child content that he had at his house again. What is going on with adults in these situations who are watching this happen and doing nothing about it? Now, we leave that whole scenario. We move on to other stories. Again, I, I feel as though this docuseries splinters off in a million different directions. They have some black actors who were child stars at the time come on and say that they believed that Dan Schneider was allegedly racist. And... The guy's justification for saying this, I believe his name is Brian, and he was a child star who was uh, accompanied by his mother on the Nickelodeon set. He said that Bron that uh, Dan allegedly didn't pay much attention to black kids or, you know, he didn't want to hang around them as much. Uh, and he felt that Dan gave more attention to the white child co-stars, which is just a strange, strange statement to make, considering that this entire docuseries is meant to paint Dan Schneider as this sort of creep uh, with a god complex who's constantly like pulling the strings and doing inappropriate things. What Would you want his attention? <laughs> I'm a little, a little confused there. So they try to sort of slowly inject little, little sprinkles of uh, racist accusations in there. And that's when you sort of get the understanding that the journalists behind this docuseries clearly have a left-leaning intent in what they're they're creating. I wish that what they had done was stick to the cold, hard facts of, of what happened, stick to the more extreme cases of illegality of what was happening at Nickelodeon, because you get so many different things that are insinuated about Dan Schneider, about the general culture at, uh, at Nickelodeon, the hostile work environment, and a million different accusations are thrown, some of which are illegal, others are not illegal and up for interpretation, and it does sort of mangle the more serious accusations that are displayed to us throughout this series. Now, in episode two, they get into the idea that allegedly Dan Schneider had encouraged kids to break child labor laws by having them work longer hours than they were supposed to, that he had written really weird sketches for them that were very strenuous. They showed uh, a Nickelodeon series that they would do that was essentially a kid's version of Fear Factor, where they would have these kids do really weird and disgusting dares. One of the kids had to sit in a tub of worms. Another had to put a scorpion in his mouth. Another kid had to be covered in peanut butter and dogs came out and licked him whilst he was being filmed for TV. And mind you, these are all things that we saw as children and thought nothing of. Of course, why Watching it back, it is a little insane, but what's really interesting about this is as weird and as gross and disgusting and creepy as some of these scenes are, it's not illegal. So it's unfortunate that these things were allowed by seemingly a hierarchy at Nickelodeon that just thought that this was something that was acceptable for the time, and that's what these children had to endure. I think the only sort of illegal statement that was made uh, in regard to Dan Schneider, who's receiving much of the heat in the wake of this docuseries being released, is the fact that he had children working extra hours and didn't seemingly care about child labor laws. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Now, at the end of episode two, 
we bring in a new name and the name is Brian Peck. And he's apparently a coach who worked alongside a lot of child stars. Now, we don't hear the allegations against Brian Peck until the very end of the episode, but he's sort of set up as this figure who's constantly has his name around. He's working with these child stars, having them coach at his home, uh, bringing them all together to come hang out at his house. And one of the child stars says, while he was at Brian Peck's house, he noticed that he had a, a big photograph of a clown or a painting of a clown and he pointed it out and Brian picked it up and was just in awe expressing where he got this clown painting from and on the back of it it was uh, signed by John Wayne Gacy and for those of you who don't know who John Wayne Gacy is uh, that's uh, this man a uh, serial killer and sex offender who was known for assaulting uh, and then slaying young men. So really weird that a person who's working with child stars, many of whom were young boys, had this painting from John Wayne Gacy, but they also had stacks of letters. They were this serial killer's pen pal whilst he was in prison, writing back and forth, and clearly had some sort of relationship with one another. What they talked about, I have no idea. But this became common knowledge because Brian Peck was displaying this painting to everybody and saying that he had this pen pal relationship with John Wayne Gacy. Now, I don't know if there were adults present when he was doing this display. It is not said uh, in the docuseries whether or not parents were there. But how did this get to nobody and nobody raised a red flag as to this sort of behavior being around children? And once we get into what Brian Peck really did, you're going to hear more. Taylor, did you want to elaborate on anything? <laughs> I mean, I, what else is there to say? Like, that's the most giant red flag in the history of red flags. If you're corresponding with a, the most notorious like child uh, pedophilic ser serial killer in existence. And the, the, the fact that it was a painting of a clown, I've watched a documentary on John Wayne Gacy, and I think he would use his dressing up as a clown to, uh, to gain access to children's spaces and stuff. Um, and that was part of his whole uh, shtick when it came to committing the crimes that he committed. So just, again, just a crazy red flag just waving right in front of you and a massive failure uh, on the part of people who are around there to uh, to to do something, say something, have more scrutiny, and just to go back a little bit to the mother of the, the mm -hmm. speaking of like the the failures, um, like I get that it was a different. When I first started watching that segment, it was like okay, it was a different time. Email was like barely a new thing then, in like the early 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 two thousands. So maybe the correspondence is innocent enough you know, um, and the fact that she's reading it or whatever. Um, but when it became evident that this man was sending nude photos to her daughter, that's where, okay, I no longer have a grace and yeah. you absolutely made the most egregious moral failing or I don't know, there's so many in this documentary, but that just stood out to me as like one of the most crazy things because like you said it's not just your daughters at stake now it's the other people that this person could be offending against and just to to leave that unreported was just mind-blowingly bad uh, so anyway those those are my thoughts i guess that have uh have come up and then i guess one more is when you were talking about the um the way that there were so many different angles that the documentary uh, maker filmmakers were mm -hmm. sort of introducing and stuff. It, it really did make it a little bit confusing because it kind of puts the onus on the audience to parse out like what's, well, how much is your opinion of like wanting to analyze power structures and blame everything on the the white males or whatever? And then how much is the opinion of the people who are attributing their mistreatment to racism, et cetera? Right. Um, and, and then how much of it is just the, the cold hard facts? And I think like a more the facts are crazy enough to speak for themselves, as is evident. And just to, like the, watching the chat as we describe some of the things that were laid out in the documentary. And those are the things that all of us should have to contend with. And the, the way that they kind of did weave in their own narrative in those cases and allowed people. I've seen this in um, documentaries about people like on the Hillsong documentary where people have gone through abuse in churches and things like that. Uh, they often bring in people who are 
hurt themselves and have a particular way that they have processed that hurt. Um, but it is very much still like or the wound is still open and mm-hmm. they're kind of just bleeding. And there's here's the story I tell myself about this. And it's not from this place of like separation, like I've healed from this and I'm I'm a rational, like objective person who has a story to tell, but I'm not here to like, because I specifically have this massive bone to pick and I just want to, you know, convince everybody of how I've been victimized, but more so like, I want to, I want to prevent this from happening. And here's how I've processed my trauma. And you had a mix of that. Yes. But I think the, the ones that, uh, emphasize their, you know, like ex- more spurious connections to racism or whatever were less helpful than the ones that were more had pro- like the guy who called out the John Wayne Gacy thing. He seemed like very matter of fact, yes. and had a good head on his shoulders. So anyway, just some more uh, thoughts on a few of the points you just hit. Yeah, there's little things that you kind of have to like see through and say, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of personal bias in what you're saying with some of the people that they decided to interview. And there's also like a glaringly obvious uh sort of recognition that some of the bigger names who probably have much more egregious grievances against Nickelodeon either did not want to participate in this or had already said their piece in in the past and decided not to be involved in this project. You also, I'm going to say this, I don't know if anybody else recognizes this, I think Taylor recognizes when you're hearing from the two female journalists who are sort of responsible for taking you through the story and piecing together what they did in their investigation there's almost this excited energy that they have in sharing the details of the children's abuse with you almost like a I'm so glad I found this out and I'm so glad I'm the one that gets to tell you I don't know if anybody else noticed that energy but it was a little uh, just strange for me I can totally understand the idea of this being a really bombshell story and it's huge and you're a woman who's discovered it and you're ushering in this sort of uh, bring down the predator energy but I could feel it through the screen as I was watching the documentary when very serious things were being discussed. Okay, we're gonna get back to unpacking this for those of you who are keeping up with the storyline here. So I introduced you to Brian Peck, who was an acting coach uh, working uh, with many in Nickelodeon. You see him featured here with uh, Josh Peck and uh, what's his name? Uh, Keenan Thompson or something like that, Uh right? Isn't that, isn't that his name? You, you'll let yeah, me know. Yeah, Thompson. Yeah, you'll yeah. let me know in the chat. So he worked with many uh, in, in Nickelodeon, had a pretty extensive career there. And at the end of episode two, after we're introduced to Brian Peck, we hear the John Wayne Gacy story. We get a little bit of background as to who he is and what his personality is like. It is announced that he was arrested for lewd and lascivious acts with a child, uh, meaning that he sexually assaulted a child. It is also revealed that it is a child star, although we don't know who it is yet. And the way that Nickelodeon handles this, according to the child star accounts, is that they come in to work on set that day and the, I don't know, executives at Disney or higher ups at Disney, I don't know exactly who, let me make that very clear, tells the parents, can you leave the room for a second so that we can, you know, talk to our actors and actresses? For some reason, uh, I guess every single parent who was in the room went, yep, I will leave this room right now so that you can talk to my children. I'm assuming they thought it would be about work or running lines or something like that. And they announced to the children alone in a room without their parents that Brian Peck, who they had all been very familiar with, was arrested for lewd and lascivious acts with a child. Now, why they would feel the need to leave the parents out of the room, I do not know. I can only speculate as to why those individuals would do that. I'll allow you to uh, make your own conclusions on that. So people are hearing hush things. It's a child star. We don't know who it is. This guy is classified as John Doe within the court filings because he is a minor. And then Drake Bell appears on the screen. And of course, that is Drake Bell of Drake and Josh. For those of you who don't remember him, here are some photos. Of course, if you were a Nickelodeon kid, Drake Bell was present all the way throughout your childhood. Uh, You would have seen his face quite a lot. Uh, And he remained on Nickelodeon after all of this turmoil that he experienced. So that's the close to episode two. We find out that it's Drake Bell. Episode three opens up and this is the most heart wrenching 
episode, I think you will watch. I was brought to tears by the the story that was told throughout uh, this episode. It even makes me emotional right now, even thinking about it. But we talk about Drake Bell, his history of wanting to be a star, wanting to be on stage, his parents' allowance of him to pursue that dream, and him ending up at Nickelodeon working alongside Amanda Bynes on the Amanda show. Now, Drake's dad is seemingly his guardian and carer during much of his time at Nickelodeon. And this is when we meet a responsible adult, I believe almost for the first time throughout this entire docuseries. Drake's dad makes it abundantly clear that he is always going to be within earshot or eyeshot of Drake when he is working at Nickelodeon on set offset it doesn't matter he's going to be there he makes that clear so drake's dad is is watching as drake is working at nickelodeon and he immediately uh, gets a red flag when he meets brian peck brian is always around drake he's very touchy with drake he's helping drake in and out of his clothing and costumes when he's working on set and immediately the dad notices that this is not okay he sort of lightly asserts himself says drake can do things on his own and make some mental notes to always keep an eye out for brian peck and to never leave drake alone with brian peck now you'll ask yourself so how did it come to be that Drake eventually is abused by Brian Peck? Well, Brian, like many manipulators does, sort of inserts himself into the relationship that Drake has with his dad, starts planting seeds of you don't want you know, your dad to be your manager. You want somebody outside your family to do that. He knows that Drake comes from a broken home as his parents are divorced. And eventually Drake decides hey, dad, I don't want you to be my manager. Let's let mom handle things. And Drake goes to his mom. I believe uh, it is said around age 15. So the mom takes over things. And you get this moment where the dad breaks down thinking about the fact that his 15-year-old son came to him and said he no longer wanted him to be a part of this. But he decides to respect the wishes of his son because he's much older now. There's nothing he can do to really assert himself in the situation. He goes to Drake's mom. He turns over Drake's bank account, all of the information. She starts handling things. And he directly tells Drake's mother, do not allow him to be alone with Brian Peck. I don't care what else you get from me. That man should not be alone with our son. And there we have the issue. The dad states that at some point, Brian Peck tricks the mother. He's hanging around Drake a lot. He's taking him to Disneyland, going back and forth. The mother apparently doesn't want to drive Drake back and forth to different auditions and different bits of work that he's doing. So Brian Peck takes up that responsibility. And because Drake lives so far away from Los Angeles, where he's doing all this work, Brian Peck says, you can stay at my house. And one of these nights, uh, Drake stays there. Uh, and he wakes up to uh, an assault happening at the hands of Brian Peck. He decides to keep this a secret. He does not go into the details of the many assaults that he endured uh, by Brian Peck, but they do show the court filings. You guys can uh, look into some of that. Um, I will say it was stated that there was sodomy and forcible penetration and oral copulation. These are the things that he ended up being tried for after he was arrested. And Drake states, just think of the worst possible things that somebody could do to a child, and that is what happened to me. And he keeps this a secret for quite some time until we have another adult step into the situation. And yes, another reasonable, rational-minded adult. Drake gets a girlfriend. He's hanging out at the girlfriend's house a lot. He no longer wants to be around Brian Peck for obvious reasons. And one day, Brian is meant to take Drake to Disneyland and Drake doesn't want to go. He's hanging out at his girlfriend's house. The girlfriend's mom is there. And Brian Peck starts calling, 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 calling Drake's phone. He's not picking up. He's not answering. So then this grown man in his 40s decides to call his girlfriend's mom over and over and over again. She picks up the phone. She hands the phone to Drake. And Drake is like, hey, yeah, I know we had plans. I, I'm just going to stay here. I double booked my plans. And he's livid. He's upset. Uh, he's going off on Drake about the fact that they had plans. And immediately, obviously, the mom is clued into what's happening, or at the very least, that there's something wrong. And she actually does what an adult should do, 
pulls Drake Bell aside into a private room without his girlfriend there and says, what's going on? Drake doesn't admit to her what's happening. She ends up taking him to their family therapist. He doesn't admit it to the therapist. But eventually, as Brian Peck is continuing to sort of put his claws into this child and try to get closer and closer to his life, tries to work on the set of Drake and Josh with Drake Bell as the father on the show, he attempts to to get that role. Drake Bell explodes one day and tells his mother everything that happened. And luckily, his mother immediately calls the police and uh, Brian Peck is arrested. And you would think that's traumatic enough uh, for a young kid to go through. But of course, this then goes to court. He has to explain in excruciating detail everything that this grown man did to him. And his court is just him and his family because nobody else is supposed to know about what happened to him. And he is listed as John Doe, as I told you earlier. And Brian Peck has an entire you know courtroom full of people behind him there to support him. Apparently, Drake says there were some very familiar faces in that courtroom, although the docuseries never lets you know exactly who. But uh, what we often have in these court cases is that people will write letters of support to the person who is being tried for uh, the crime that they're up for. We very famously saw this happen in the Danny Masterson case. If you guys are familiar, Danny Masterson from that 70s show uh, was convicted of sexual assault and all these different celebrities had written in sort of character letters to speak to his character and to hopefully uh, ask for leniency on his sentence. Famously, uh, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis received a lot of heat for writing one for Danny Masterson. Now, there were many celebrities who ended up writing uh, support letters for Brian Peck in the Drake Bell case. James Marsden is one of them, which was kind of insane. Taryn Killam, Alan Thicke, Ryder Strong, and Will Friedel, who were both featured in Boy Meets World. But it's made very clear that these people might, may or may not may not have known the full extent of what they were writing character letters for, and uh, that they they may have not known the exact details of the offense that was alleged against Brian Peck. Now, there were a few horrific letters, uh, in my opinion, written by Rich and Beth Carell, who worked at Nickelodeon and uh, would later go on to work at Disney, and Kimmy Robertson, who is also an actress. Where in these letters, they insinuate that the only reason that Brian Peck would have abused somebody like Drake Bell is because they were tempted and drawn to the situation and the kid must have tempted him in some way that made him cave in. And that was the reason that the abuse happened. Rich Carell, who worked alongside Brian Peck on, on set, went as far as to say he would work with Brian Peck again in his letter. We all talk about Holly Weird and how crazy it is in Hollywood and how uh, the abuse of child stars is extensive and that there are many responsible and many who are aware of this. And in hearing about some of these letters, it is insane the things that people say about grown adults who are committing acts of abuse against children. And guess what? Brian Peck goes to court. He's convicted. What does he get? 16 months. 16 months in jail. That's his sentence. 16 months in jail is what he gets for the extended assault of Drake Bell and who knows who else. And interestingly enough, I'm going to speculate like a little bit. And they they show at some point in this docuseries a video of Brian Peck beside a young Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's a very short clip. But in the video, you see Brian Peck grab Leo's arm and sort of run his hand down his arm in a very sort of romantic fashion. Now, I do not know, I'll be very clear, what happened between Brian Peck and Leonardo DiCaprio, if anything. All I know is the history between Brian Peck and Drake Bell. But does it maybe make sense that Leonardo DiCaprio is dating a bunch of 20 year olds now when he's a, a grown man and he has seemingly a lot of problems with uh, sexual promiscuity and sort of being sort of frivolous with his sexual activity, given the fact that a video like this uh, with a known child abuser exists out there on the Internet? Again, speculating. I'm not uh, accusing him of anything. I'm just saying 
the dots are connecting, the math is mathing when we watch what happens to these child stars later on in their adulthood. And there are very clear patterns to be drawn that more often than not are born out of abuse. Anything to share on that, Taylor, before we unpack some well, more? I mean, they, they, yeah, you can quickly be called like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist when you start to talk about some of the crazy sexual stuff like you hear about these parties and the the different like rituals and you know like pat williams was just on joe rogan talking about the uh ritual of making actors wear male actors wear dresses and things like that and yeah um but cases like this is where it's not just speculation there's there's actual abuse happen and just when when the the Brian Peck story is being told in, in that episode. Uh, it just drives home to me this uh, this a sense that access attracts abusers, right? And places where uh, uh, you can have access to vulnerable people uh, who would be the target of abusers, guess what? That's where the abusers are going to show up. And of course, I can't help but be reminded of just the ongoing debate and, and talk that we have all the time about women's spaces and how the sort of ideological commitments of, of uh, the, you know, gender ideology uh, creates a loophole that gives access to women's spaces to people who want to exploit that and gain access to victims. Um, and that when you have a loophole like that, when you have a place where vulnerable people are who would be targets, so in this case, children, it's going to attract those abusers. That's not to say that everyone who works in that industry is an abuser. It's not to say that all trans people are abusers, but it, does, it is to say that we need to be hyper-conscious of spaces that vulnerable children or women or people in general are. And uh, we need to make damn sure that every length is being taken to uh, protect the vulnerable in those cases. And that's the, mm -hmm. my, my last thought is just as Drake was telling his story, it's like he's growing up, he's experiencing fame, he's uh, coming into his own, he's starting to get more independent fame and such. And uh, you can see in his mind, he thinks he's mature enough to make these big mm -hmm. life choices. He thinks he's mature enough to uh, carry the weight of, of the life that he's living and have uh, a degree of independence. And you can kind of see the same echoes of that in Amanda Bynes. But the reality is these are children and we do not allow children to make big life altering decisions for a reason because yeah. they can be manipulated. They can be, uh, be fooled into doing things that are very much against their own interests and they simply do not have the wherewithal and the maturity to handle uh, all these things and they need people like Drake's father to be there, be present and be protective. And uh, I think that again, to me, you can't help but connect that to the debate around uh, the gender affirming care that we're talking about a lot the, these days with the, the idea that children can kind of consent and, and or should be treated as these uh, as adults, essentially, when it comes to their well being and their medical decisions for themselves. And it's just very dangerous. And we have to be so, so cautious when it comes to children, so, so vigilant when it comes to protected spaces. Yeah, 100%. It's just so sad to think about like all the innocent children who would have just thought they were getting the break of a lifetime and being able to be in a Nickelodeon show and get to do things that not a lot of children do. And it's a wonderful opportunity to have as a kid. We're going to talk at the end about whether or not we should even have child stars, whether or not this should even be an occupation allowed to children as they do get into that conversation very briefly at the end of episode four. But you think it's this golden opportunity when really it's just a, a, a trove of people waiting to exploit you from, you know, parents to the people on set, the people running the show who rely on your labor. There are so many people from so many different angles who are ready to exploit these children or to ignore red flags or to sort of sweep under the rug really horrible things that are happening for the sake of paychecks and fame and wealth. And that's another through line that I noticed in they, they featured many parents who seemingly 
recognized how inappropriate the jokes were at the time, not later, but at the time recognized this. They were recognizing inappropriate dynamics between the children and the people working there. They were seeing the signs that something was not okay and that this was not a safe environment for children. And outside of Drake's dad and Drake's girlfriend's mom, all of these parents found a way to not to either justify the situation or to ignore what was happening. And while they may have sprinkled in complaints every now and then, as soon as they received pushback or their child's placement on the show as an actor or actress was threatened, the parents would back off. And that signals to me that as a parent, you cared more about the bottom line that your child is bringing in income and fame and stardom than you did about the actual safety of your child. And I think that's what happens when the parent-child relationship is flipped upside down and it is no longer the child relying on the parent for safety and security. It is the parent relying on the child for safety and income and security. When you have that dynamic within a relationship, it is paramount that above all other priorities is the safety and wellness of your child. And I'm not sure how long that priority can remain intact when you're working with something like a child star, because time and time again, we've seen failure after failure after failure. And, you know, as much as there should be significant blame placed on the adult men who are perpetrating these horrific acts, and if they are doing something illegal, put them in jail. In fact, put them under the jail, in my opinion. There is not enough onus placed on the parents who actively placed their children in situations that they knew were unsafe. And that doc, this docuseries does not go into that whatsoever. Doesn't say a lick about it other than the parents saying, oh, I couldn't call the police or I felt like we were going to get pushed out so I didn't do anything. Nobody takes an ounce of accountability when it comes to that. OK, so episode three goes through everything that happened with Drake Bell. Uh, the most heartbreaking moments are, of course, Drake Bell detailing his abuse, his father going through the realization that this happened, because at one point Drake actually calls his father and says, you know, they got Brian Peck because he knew his father had had these suspicions about him. And the dad is under the impression that he had abused another child and says something to the effect of, well, I'm so glad that they arrested him before they could get to you. And Drake did not have it in him to tell his father that it was actually him, that he was John Doe. And his father later makes that realization and says he has not been the same individual since. And I cannot imagine the horror of having that sort of sixth sense about somebody, recognizing it, trying to keep your child away from him, warning the person who is meant to be responsible for being a guardian for your child and then having it fall through the cracks and your child being John Doe in something that you can't really come back from. You know, you can repair and you can learn and go to therapy and you can heal, but it's always a wound that that stays there. Uh, and of course, like I said, Brian Peck gets 16 months in, in jail and then has to register as a sex offender. But does this keep him away from children? Does it keep him from working on future sets within Hollywood? No, it doesn't. Brian Peck goes on to work on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, a show featuring two young, minor twin boys. So uh, that... That's, a, I guess, a silver silver lining here that you can be registered as a sex offender, have 16 months in jail, which is not enough of a sentence. And you can go back to doing a very similar job to the one you did. Not only did he go on to work on uh, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, who worked alongside him on that project, none other than Rich and Beth Carell, who wrote the character letter that they would be so happy uh, to work with Brian Peck again in the future. Well, Rich did, in fact, get that opportunity on The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. So there's that. Then through episode four, we start getting into other Nickelodeon stars. You'll hear very familiar names, Jeanette McCurdy, Ariana Grande, Alexa Nicholas. And you will know Alexa Nicholas because if you saw our original Nickelodeon video, we talked about her on the show. She has this whole thing that she's put together called Eat Predators, where she talks about predators within Hollywood at Nickelodeon, other celebrities, uh, her own assault that she's experienced at the hands of Hollywood elites. And they had gone and protested out 
outside of Nickelodeon. Here she is with a sign that says Nickelodeon didn't protect me. And she details a lot of, of the hostile work environment that she endured whilst working at a Nickelodeon, allegedly. And the inappropriate scenes that she was part of in uh, while whilst working on Zoe 101. I watched Zoe 101 almost every day as a child. I absolutely loved that show. And to hear her break down in referencing some of the blatantly sexualized scenes that she was part of was really devastating uh, to, to just go back and hear about. And I'll describe some of these scenes of, of course, if you watch Victorious, you'll notice that there, the through line is apparently feet. Uh, allegedly, Dan Schneider was really into writing feet into these shows. The kids would put their feet out. Adults would be touching them in the show. There's crazy scenes with Ariana Grande putting her feet in her mouth. I, I, I find it strange even describing the sort of scenes, even though they aired on Nickelodeon and we all watched them as kids. Um, there's a scene of Ariana Grande laying in a bed, pouring water all over her body, uh, squeezing a potato and questioning whether or not she can get juice out of the potato whilst doing very, you know, sexual things uh, in, in the scene itself. Alexa Nicholas is apparently opening something called a goo pop and trying to get it open and it bursts onto uh, Jamie Lynn Spears' face. This all aired on Nickelodeon for uh, our viewing pleasure, apparently. Uh, and of course, they then get into Jeanette McCurdy, who wrote a book, a uh, very famous book now called I'm Glad My Mom Died, where she details the abuse that she endured at the hands of her mother. And she also talks about what she endured at Nickelodeon. Now, she references somebody called the creator and details that the creator was this sort of ominous presence on set responsible for creating the show who would flip on you on a dime if he was upset, if he didn't like something that you did, if he felt like he was losing his power with you. He would have female employees give him massages while he was working on set and all the kids could just watch as this happened. Now, it seems abundantly clear that the, re the creator is allegedly referencing Dan Schneider as he is the creator of all of these shows. He is the showrunner for all of these shows. And they go through a slew of scenes that are just so uh, blatantly clear as far as sexualizing children. Now, the thing is, um, you're going to hear the name Dan, 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 Dan Schneider all throughout this entire documentary. Nothing that they detail in this documentary outside of him possibly breaking child labor laws or encouraging the kids to break child labor laws is technically illegal. I want to make that clear. He is not technically being accused of anything illegal. People are just alluding to the fact that what he's done is clearly, you know, sexual in nature and speaks to some sort of underlying perversion that you'd think would be present. And he has since come out and defended himself and will show a little bit of that defense. But all of this leads up to Dan Schneider being investigated for the accusation of a hostile work environment. They go through this investigation at Nickelodeon and the docuseries claims that Nickelodeon tells Dan, you can no longer you know, talk to your actors and actresses. We needed to keep a, de a degree of separation between you and them. Dan Schneider denies this allegation that he was kept out of the writer's room or kept away from the set. So I don't know what is true and what is false, but that's the end of the investigation and what that brings about. Then we have the Me Too movement and uh, the Harvey Weinsteins of the world and the hashtag Believe All Women and all these different accusations coming out. And Again, people are coming after Dan, talking about this hostile work environment, talking about the massages, the inappropriate jokes, all of these different things. And Dan is let go from Nickelodeon uh, once he finishes his time. And that's essentially where the documentary ends. They go into a little piece at the end where each of the child stars details the struggles that they've had in adulthood uh, with drug usage and alcoholism, DUIs, run-ins with the law, uh, issues with their mental health. One girl says that if her child ever wanted to be a child star, she would say no quicker than anybody has ever said no before. And Drake Bell, sort of insinuates that he would think twice if, if somebody asked him to uh, be a child star. 
but he hesitates and sort of grapples with the fact that he had a, a really good lifestyle set out for him, that the fame and the stardom and being on stage was something that he always wanted to do, and he, that he just finds it unfortunate that a safe environment couldn't be created for him to do that. And that's really where the documentary closes out. That's how Quiet On Set, uh, the dark side of kids' TV, goes. I do want to show you, because Dan Schneider expeditiously uh, responded to some of the allegations in an interview that he filmed. And you're going to notice the interviewer if you watched iCarly. Y'all know Tebow from the smoothie shop, the really wacky, zany character who had, you know, donuts on a stick and all this different crazy stuff and tacos on a stick and iCarly. And you'll see him. He's the one who's interviewing Dan Schneider. Let's play it so that you guys can get a vibe and make your own judgments. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. You've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Looking back at them 20 years later through their lens, and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show. Just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like it. The more people who like the show, the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say with your work, mm -hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. Cut it. <sighs> cut it. Seeing some of those on-air dares, seeing it now from where you are now in your life, what do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. You were banned from your set. Never, never, never happened. They were adult actresses at the time, and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Mm. I'm not judging that. It got tense, and what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm going to do what most showrunners do, which is you're not on the set. There's a director there to shoot it. I'll go up to the writer's room. I'll work on the next script. But yeah. Okay, so there you go. A little piece from uh, Dan Schneider, obviously extremely strategic to bring in a familiar face that everybody recognizes from iCarly as this sort of smiley, happy, zany character and have him deliver a very smiley, happy, zany interview where he gives no pushback whatsoever to anything that Dan Schneider says, where he's not forced to contend with somebody who actually has real grievances with him. And I think that's a failure on his part to take real true accountability because you can put a little familiar face across from yourself and have them ask you questions that you immediately answer and then we move on to the next one. But he's not receiving any pushback from, from somebody who, at the very least, does not have uh, you know, a conflict of interest in interviewing him. So I thought that was a poor choice on his part, that he should have, at the very least, had somebody else interview him and allow for actual pushback on the things that he's saying. Now, as far as the substance, he needs to take way more accountability for the sexual nature of what he wrote those children into and the environment that they, that they may have fostered on his set. Because I'm not hearing many people talk about the fact that you're doing these sexual scenes in front of other adults. Don't you think that's encouraging the sort of adultification of what are minors on your set? 
and it it makes it almost a comfortable place for for predators if you're allowing children to engage in this sort of activity publicly and then putting it on TV. Now, Dan Schneider's main defense is that there were hundreds of adults who watched this happen, who read the scripts, who promoted the material, who edited the episodes, who greenlit the episodes before they went out, executives who knew what these shows were like and what was going out on the air. So there are hundreds of adults that are meant to be held accountable in this docuseries. And I think the docuseries fails to make that point as well, maybe because they didn't want to detract from really laying the heat on Dan Schneider. I think you can lay the heat on him as the the creator and, and showrunner whilst also saying this went through a ladder of other adults who watched this content and somehow found no problem with children being placed in this position and this being put on the internet. So he has an entire interview with that guy if you guys want to go and check it out. I just wanted to show you a snippet. With the snippet, you can sort of understand exactly uh, what is being said there. I also do not want to leave out a note that uh, many, I think, are forgetting to talk about. Drake Bell is, of course, the focal point of this documentary, and his assault is uh, very much a focal point, and, you know, deservedly so. It's a focal point of this documentary. It's heinous what he endured. He has also, uh, in his adulthood, been sentenced to two years of probation for child endangerment. And this happened after uh, a former female fan of his accused him of sexual misconduct. She alleges that they met when she was 12 years old, as she was a fan of him, and that grooming started from that point up until she was 15. Now, the reason that he ended up receiving two years probation for a child endangerment and I believe 200 hours of community service is because they had sent inappropriate text messages uh, back and forth and that was what he received the two years of probation for and the 200 hours of community service. This young girl also alleges that they engaged in sexual behavior with one another. However, he was not convicted of engaging with sexual behavior in sexual behavior with this girl. I want to make that clear. It's also been uh, alleged that she had lied about her age. Now, I don't know about that. I also have not seen uh, what this girl looks like, and that would be pretty telling as to what her age is, but I believe this went to court when she was 18. So bear that in mind with the uh, Drake Bell allegations. I want to paint as full of a picture as possible, and that's not something that I believe should be left out, because I do see a lot of people who are maybe sweeping his misconducts under the rug in the wake of this news. But it is crazy to me that Drake Bell receives two years probation and 200 hours community service for the, the text messages and, and this, and Brian Peck got 16 months in jail and had to register? as a sex offender, that's it? That's all you got for what you did to him? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Insane. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I missed here. Taylor, anything that I'm, anything you want to add? Uh, I mean, we could probably talk all day about all the stuff that, that has happened in, um, and everything that's unpacked in the documentary and all the different uh, tangents conversation that could be stemmed from, but just one thing on what you're just talking about with, mm -hmm. with Drake Bell and how it is important to note that, you know, it, two things can be true at once. You can be a victim and an offender. And yeah. the, you know, I'm reminded of the quote, I think it's Solzhenitsyn who said like the line between good and evil goes through every human heart. And it could be true that, you know, Dan Schneider built this toxic work environment allegedly and, you know, did all these sexualized jokes and such, uh, but it's also, and he bears responsibility for that. But people who enabled him by refusing to say no, be they executives, be they people uh, on set, uh, employees, etc., and went along with it, bear some more responsibility as well. Um, obviously, Brian Peck, and I forget the, the first uh, offender's name for, with uh, the, the girl earlier on, but both of them obviously did horrendous acts that need to be punished. And of course, Brian Peck did not get enough time in jail. Um, yeah. But the negligence of the parents uh, is also a moral failing in this case and other people who uh, were had reason to believe in red flags. And so, again, I think just the, the underexplored part of this documentary and the under 
emphasized point that I think we should all be contending with is just how that we all have a moral responsibility to stand up against evil, wickedness, uh, wrong whenever we come across it, even if and even especially if uh, we stand to lose something if in doing so. And of course, that's easier said than done. But that is something that we have to contend with as human beings, because you will be confronted with bad actors, you will be confronted with people in your life who are going to cross lines. And sometimes it may cost you something to stand up against them. But you know, you look at history, you look at the Soviet Union, you look at Nazi Germany, and just the way that these people were uh, like people like Hitler, people like Stalin were able to accomplish uh, everything that they accomplished and ascend to power and, and achieve the domination that they achieved. It was because of, in large part, and this is what something that Solzhenitsyn concluded, uh, people being willing to go along with the lie to, mm -hmm. or in order to avoid near term consequences. And uh, again, easier said than done, but it's just a very serious reality that humans have contended with uh, through time immemorial. And we will have to continue to do so. So it's not as simple as externalizing the problem to the patriarchy or white supremacy or the greed of the capitalists at the head of Nickelodeon. Those are all real things, maybe, and we can talk about them on their merits. But I think uh, some self-reflection is in order for all of us after watching this. Yeah. And, you know, you think about like the the environment of Nickelodeon and being a place for children and children's entertainment attracts predators. This is what predators do. They put themselves in the best position to be around children. That's why they are in schools, in churches, at places like Nickelodeon. So your first line of defense is, of course, being a diligent parent who watches out for your child and understands the nature of that responsibility and the nature of the environment that you are placing your child in, the nature of the power dynamics that now exist because of what your child is doing for work. But second to the parents is Nickelodeon. Like, what the hell was going on there? Now, it's hard to uh, indict them on anything in here because they can say, well, you know, these people didn't have criminal records when we hired them. There was no way of knowing, although they did end up hiring one employee who just worked on the lot that Nickelodeon was present at, who actually did have a prior history of uh, uh, convictions of assaulting a child, and then he ended up assaulting another child on the lot. However, this was not a child star. They sort of just threw this story in here, even though it was sort of, but not exactly associated. The major failure there was that Nickelodeon did not catch this glaringly huge spot on this guy's record. So there, there needs to be safeguards put in place. And I don't know what's happened in between the time where we all watch Nickelodeon and now as far as safeguards for child stars, obviously a lot has changed within uh, Hollywood and laws have shifted somewhat. And now if you're on a set, there's intimacy coordinators and all these different things, although we wouldn't be dealing with that with child stars. But clearly there's been some movement and some conversation surrounding how to keep people safe and how to keep people comfortable. But that conversation really needs to be centered on children and I don't know that it's even like okay you know we used to complain and be like oh they're doing a show about high school and middle school but there's 20 year olds playing the characters it's so weird you're clearly not 15 you're clearly not 13 now I'm like you know what cast a bunch of 20 year olds to play the middle schoolers and the high schoolers and leave out the little kids if you can leave them out of the story there's no reason for a child to be in that environment and and not be just because of predators. I mean, predators can exist anywhere uh, if we're going to make that argument. It's just the nature of doing a job like that. It's the nature of having a child who does not understand the world or their place in it take on a, a fake role and have to act and sort of put on a performance for, for adults that are make or breaking this child's future. It's the idea of handing a child dreams like fame and stardom and then having that ripped away after a season of a show show or placing them in envir an environment where they're surrounded by other adults who are doing really weird things. Like we know what's happening within Hollywood. Drew Barrymore talks about the fact when she was a child star, she was going out to parties with adults, drinking, doing drugs as a minor. It's just not a healthy environment for a child, in my opinion, any way you slice the cake. It doesn't make sense for them to be there. So 
hire the 20 year olds to play the 15 year olds. I don't care. I'll take a hit on my entertainment and, you know, suspend my disbelief a little bit when it comes to what I'm watching on the screen. If it means that children are not actively being victimized for the sake of somebody's entertainment and so that their parents can make money. That's really it at the end of the day. As much as we can like reinforce this with laws and things like that, things are gonna slip through the cracks. And it seems like even child stars who go through what we would claim to be a safe experience within Hollywood end up so messed up. Like we see child stars who end up normal with marriages and families and we go, oh my gosh, you're like the one out of the hundred that made it. And we're, we're celebrating the ones who turn out normal. If that doesn't show you that we have a problem, I don't know what will. But this documentary highlighted it, although it could have done better and it could have done without some of the other messaging that they were clearly trying to promote throughout it. And it was kind of kind of a hot mess and all over the place as far as all the different subject matters it was trying to cover from patriarchy to racism to sexual assault to child emancipation to stardom to drugs and alcohol. I need one subject and I need you to focus on that one subject, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. which didn't didn't exactly happen. But it's sort of blown the cover on something that I feel like we've all known about for quite some time or had feeling towards it. And I'm telling you now, this documentary only scratches the surface of what's happened at Nickelodeon, what's happened at Disney, what's happened with every nearly every child star that has existed up until this point. You guys know, like the stories of. Corey Feldman and River Phoenix and how these things pan out and all the different allegations that have come out and then been sort of covered up and and never talked about again. There's more. I'm even thinking about the fact that uh, Victorious, which is a show that a ton of us watched, if you are my age, 23, uh, Liz Gillies on that show, who you recognize, she played Jade, the sort of hard, edgy character who was dating Beck. I don't know if we're allowed to say this because people have been receiving cease and desist letters for talking about it, but I'll just say allegedly, even though it's not alleged, she's married to somebody who's 20 years older than her. And where did they meet? Nickelodeon, when she was 16 years old and he was 36. And now they're married. So how exactly did that happen? And did that relationship start at Nickelodeon when she was 16 and he was 36? I don't know, but that didn't even get talked about. Uh, for one moment within the documentary, probably because people are receiving cease and desist letters. I just have a lot of questions as to how these things have come to be. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Quiet On Set. (laughs) uh, We've we've but scratched the surface, I'm sure, but it'll be curious to see what else uh, emerges now if this spurs more uh, revelations in its wake. Yeah, there's going to be so much, I think so much more. And there's so many people who haven't spoken out. Josh Peck is receiving a lot of heat now for not coming to Drake's defense. Although I don't necessarily think you're obligated as a child who is also in this environment to as an adult uh, make some sort of statement about it. It's just interesting to watch the dynamic there because I do believe that Dan Schneider did go to uh, to Josh Peck's wedding, but he hasn't spoken about anything. And maybe he signed an NDA or there's been payment. I don't know. I don't know how all this works. I imagine there's been a lot of hush-hush and NDAs and payments and things like that that have happened in the wake of some of these rumors slowly but surely coming out. But let's hear from you guys on this subject because I'm sure there's much to say. <laughs> I might need you to turn on my little bubble. Oh, yeah, no problem. It's not responding I to got me. you. All right. Uh, Stop simping on Amala is our first one. And he <laughs> says, hey there, hey and Tay. Glad to see you doing an episode with Lauren Chen. Can't wait to listen to it. Uh, last but not least, deport them. OnlyFans 304s. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Check out Lauren Chen's channel. Uh, we did do a live this morning where we talked about Star Wars, which we're gonna, also going to talk about tomorrow on this channel. What else did we speak about? Oh, my gosh. Uh, ton of, you guys have to go see. Feminism. We talked about a ton of different stuff uh, this morning with Lauren. Lady Gaga, Dylan Mulvaney. You guys can check that out on her channel. Uh, Pitlin says, hey, um, A&T, uh, the abuse at Nickelodeon actually predates Dan Snyder. If you go back to the 80s, none other than Alanis Morissette at, as a 15-year-old slept with a bunch of 40 and 50-year-old producers on, you can't say that on television, hmm. allegedly. Allegedly. I'll have to add, but. Yes, allegedly. Uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, not surprised. 
can I say that? I'm not surprised. I think, um, I, in a way, I understand the fact that Dan Schneider is the one who's really bearing the brunt of the accusations of what's happening in Nickelodeon, but I think it's a misstep. And don't make this out as me trying to lighten the allegations that are placed against him, but what this unfortunately does is it sort of makes him out to be the one person responsible for everything that was happening there. And we're not looking at the lengthy history of child stars going through this. Um, we're not looking at the fact that this is almost like a systemic issue within Hollywood. And after watching the documentary, I, I didn't really understand why Dan Schneider's name is the main name trending in all this. Like I wasn't seeing Brian Peck's name trending on Twitter and I wasn't seeing Jason Handy's name trending on Twitter when they're actually the ones who abused children. We don't have any evidence as to whether or not Dan Schneider did that. We just have the fact that we know he's creepy based on the things that he's writing and the things that he's doing with these kids. So it's, it's interesting that this is becoming like a Dan, 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 Dan thing. Um, and, you know, I second that in a lot of ways. I've tweeted that this man needs to be dealt with and he's a creep. But there's more. There's more to uncover. Yeah, not to sound, you know, invoke this like conspiratorially, but it get, does give a little bit of like the same pattern that you saw with the Epstein situation. We're like, where's the rest of the, the yeah. names? Who else is connected to this? Who else enabled it? And what, uh, what else has been responsible? So. Um, Where's yeah, the little there's, black there's book? definitely more to be answered for. Yep. <laughs> um, Aether says, hey, Amelin Taylor, what are your thoughts on Mexican food? I think it's overrated and that Cuban food is far better. Vaca <laughs> frita over nachos. I, they're both okay. I tell everybody this. I'm never, you'll never ever hear me say I'm craving Mexican food right now. Uh, that will never ever happen. I think it's my, it is my least favorite of the cuisines. Although I don't dislike it. I'll eat it and it's good. I just feel like it's like the, I don't know, it's like the same foods just repackaged. And I guess most people's cuisines are the same foods repackaged in different ways. But for some reason, Mexican, I'll, I'll eat it and it's good, but it's not something that I'm like, I need Mexican food right now. Yeah. yeah. I, back in the day, y'all, we used to go to lunch with Miyamo and Scott and me and Scott time. loved the Mexican place by the office and Amla, we had to kind of drag her there. Um, <laughs> but we did it like once a week. And yeah, we're, it was still we're good. Uh, she's a good sport. Yeah, I'll still eat it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I love Mexican food. I think there's so many like just flavors and, and stuff going on that uh, I love really like spicy and flavorful food. So mm -hmm. Cuban food, I have a running joke with our friend Sabrina, who's Cuban, um, about how Cuban food sucks, but I don't really <laughs> think it sucks. It's just, I don't know. I haven't yeah, it's had okay. Cuban food that I've absolutely loved yet. So, uh, anyways, now all the Cubans hate me. <laughs> um, Stop Simping again says, have you guys been watching Planet Fitness's stock price? I heard they lost a bunch of money in the millions in yeah. five days. Get Bud Lighted, <laughs> bichotas. Yeah, they are. It's crazy. They're, they're plummeting a little bit. And I think people are just going to keep canceling their memberships for a little while. I don't know. It says, let's see. Let's see if over, uh, over six months, it's kind of hard to hard to tell i guess over the last month you see a little bit of a oh why is the chart not available <laughs> lol huh. okay yeah you see a decline over the last month and maybe that's people just canceling their their memberships and getting rid of their their planet fitness stuff it more news keeps coming out i keep hearing more and more stories of people experiencing this at planet fitness now that the microscope's sort of on them so we'll see what happens yeah i just saw there's a new picture floating around social media of the same guy who was shaving in the women's bathroom. He's still still going to the Planet Fitness in Alaska because mm -hmm. they're standing by him. And there's another picture of him in the women's bathroom. So there you go. You know, they're holding their course. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Ryan says, hi, guys. I've been watching for over a year now. A sincere thank you for your content. You have changed my life for the better. Couldn't be oh, more grateful. Thank you. That is so sweet. <laughs> a whole year. You're an OG. I don't know what makes you an OG, what length of time, but I feel like a year, you that's OG status. Thank you so much for watching and I'm glad it's had a positive impact on you. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Celtic Blacksmith says, y'all know I'm nearly, I'm a nearly con constant goofball, but uh, the topic of adults hurting kids, especially sexually, instantly drains the life from my heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm... 
Yeah. It's such like a, it's such an act that just creates a web of destruction in its wake. And to think that it's born out of such like something as ridiculous as just like sexual energy that you would do that to somebody and cr destroy their life. It literally destroys your life. And um, one of the instances where Drake Bell is, is speaking and it's one of the saddest things he says, but it just kind of quickly gets glossed over. He talks about the fact that he doesn't remember how great his life was at the time, like all the wonderful things that he got to experience as a child star who was getting fame and doing concerts and meeting fans and being on TV. He doesn't remember any of it because it's all overshadowed. And when you experience trauma, that's exactly what happened. Your body is in this like shock response of, of dealing with the trauma and the anxiety and keeping the secret. So you're living a normal life all throughout this period and probably experiencing what would typically be really wonderful things, but it's all overshadowed by the consistent impact of the tra the trauma that somebody's bestowed upon you. And to do that for something like sexual gratification is disgusting. It affects them. It affects their parents. It affects the people around them. It affects their future relationships. It affects their entire life moving forward, not to mention the, the number of other victims that uh, these people often uh, assault. And not to mention that it makes the people who are assaulted more likely to commit acts of assault, which depending on how you view the Drake Bell situation may or may not have happened with this, uh, with this younger girl. So there's a lot to be said there. And that's not to excuse people who are victims that go on to later uh, assault people and victimize other people. It's just to say that it makes your likelihood of doing that far higher if you've experienced it in the past. Yeah. Dysfunction breeds dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, Aether says it reminds me of the IBLP Duggar documentary where they blamed the women for sexual assault because they must have been too, quote unquote, tempting. So unbelievably evil. Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. I, I like I you would never think I, I could see people making that case about adults and like we're no strangers to the like what were you wearing what were what situation were you in when when that happened and these are discussions that are consistently had and sometimes for good reason but with a child it's just like insane that an adult could fathom that it's the child's fault that this happened and those character letters were nuts um let's see lex says i'm sorry but they look like pedophiles I'm not sure who he's referring to. Maybe the Brian Probably Peck, Brian in which case would be accurate. Yeah, Jason Handy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is to, to necessarily look like a pedophile because, you know, I think we'll find that uh, they're the most normal among us sometimes. And that mm. that's what you you really got to watch out for. But I can, I can see what you're inferring. Uh, Chris, Chris Stara Shackelford says, hearing Drake Bell's father speak in this doc was so gut-wrenching to me. He actually tried to protect his kid and the character witnesses. Wow. Yeah, dude, it's, you know, when you know something ends badly, but they're like telling you the story in the lead up, it just gave you that sinking, sinking feeling because you enter the episode knowing that it's Drake Bell who endures this. And then to hear from the dad who seemingly was pulling all all the right stops except for separating Drake from the situation and stopping him from being a child star, which would have been the hardest thing to do as a father, to tell your child, I know you're really successful and I know you're the star of a TV show, but we got to pull you out of this uh, because I'm, I'm worried about something that hasn't happened yet. It's a super difficult situation to be in as, as a parent. I hope it's not a situation that I ever have to be in where I would have to rob my child of something like that because of a premonition that I have and you know putting together hints of, of what I believe a person to be or what I think they're going to do. But oh, man, it's just tough. The whole time he was talking, I, you could just see it. You could see the sincerity, the, the grief, just everything. I can't imagine. Yeah, I mean... And the fact that he has to like, he, he lives with that now too. And like justice, I don't think was, was done in mm -mm. the situation. And so to just live knowing this guy's still out there and just that all this happened, even though you saw it as preventable, it's just wild. Yeah. I wonder what his relationship is like with his ex-wife now and given just yeah. how all that unfolded and the fact that she didn't call him when Drake told her of the situation too, kind of stuck out to me. Like very strange, not, you know, you need to make a united front on this. But anyways, yeah, just yeah. so many layers. Um, 
I can prep too says I recall similar accusations surrounding Lou Pearlman. It's been an ongoing, it's been ongoing in Holly weird, in my opinion. With Lou Pearlman? What was that? Yeah, I'm not, I don't I'm not familiar that with that one either. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. Uh, let's see. Onion says missed most of this live as I was listening to the conservative versus liberal rea uh, lesbians reaction video. Oof. Oh yeah. When, do, when was that? Was that a while ago? I think so. What's the one that just came out? Oh, no, that was... That was closeted versus non-closeted. Yeah, closeted. Versus yeah interesting. Yeah. Uh, Which I don't, we still might react to. If yeah, we still might do that on, on Friday if you guys are interested in uh, listening to that one. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't watched the the conservative versus liberal lesbians Yeah, one, go check it out, guys. Go check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I was funny. I was talking with my younger brother earlier, and he was like, I don't know how you just do it constantly looking at the news like this nickelodeon documentary mm. and this crazy like woke stuff happening and all that <laughs> um i was like you know what it's not it's it's meaningful to try to unpack and speak truth to what's going on in the culture and that that in itself energizes it and we love that y'all yeah. are on the journey with us you just get um, used to it yeah go ahead you just get used to it at some point yeah that too yeah and it's like i could i could have my head in the sand but then it would just drive me nuts so. right right <laughs> I'd still know what was happening. Um, Stop simping on Amla says, yo, when I become El Presidente, uh, I'm a deport Brian Peck and the clown that said he would work with him again. This is just insane. They'd get tossed out like Jazz does in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, afuera. Yeah, I don't know how uh, how legal that process would be, uh, <laughs> given, uh, given that uh, he's already apparently done his time for... Uh, his the crime he was convicted of but you know more power to you i mean i'm reminded of some of those stories where wasn't there like a parent a dad whose kid was whose daughter was like violated by uh someone and he like shot that person to death and then the jury like refused to convict him or something yeah, like that i think it was maybe the son his son or something i think um hmm. Yeah, there's been a few instances of that. There was a mother who did uh, a very similar thing in, in the court and just took care of, of the guy. There's a movie called The Time to Kill, which I believe is based on a true story. And um, what that that father killed his daughter's abusers and I guess pled temporary insanity. So I think juries are sympathetic to that typically. Well, one would hope. They're certainly mm -hmm. sympathetic on, on a lot of wrong things. So yeah. maybe they could get something like that right. Yeah. But anyways, um, not to, allegedly, not saying allegedly. someone should go kill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Allegedly, 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 allegedly. Good Lord. Um, David Duarte Garcia says, uh, I remember at one point when social media was essentially telling Alexa Nicholas to be quiet or blaming her for the experience she had faced. Yeah, she's had a st tough time. Um I've, I've watched uh, some of her coverage of other people that she's exposed and showed messages of. And there's just a lot of real creepy individuals within Hollywood. And I'm glad that she's doing what she's doing. She gave off very broken energy in this uh, docuseries. And you can just tell. I don't know. To me, it seems like she's she's gone through something more than what she expressed in, in the documentary. Maybe it was something outside of Nickelodeon that had nothing to do with her time there, but she's, she seems like she's seen some tough, tough days. Mm -hmm. The way she broke down when she talked about like, just imagining if some, if it were her daughter that was in the same situation that she went through mm -hmm. was, was telling. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Diva Dawn says, I worked around a diaper snipers for seven years and you would be surprised how unthreatening they are. That's how they get close to kids. They aren't scary. Oh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, they will they'll probably be if you are somebody who wants to abuse children, you're probably going to be one of the most nicest, unassuming, innocent people you can possibly be. And this is sort of the manipulation tactic that they use in order to get close to children. You have to be non-threatening in order to manipulate a child. You have to be non-threatening in order to manipulate parents. Uh, so it's often going to be extremely normal people that you probably wouldn't even think twice about. Yeah. Uh, bad actors are out there. Like mm -hmm. whether you're, we have to be prepared for that. And, um, David Don says she corrected a typo that I figured out when I read it and then <laughs> says every coworker I had for hooking up with inmates, it was with a sniper sniper, which I'm assuming is her 
term for pedophile. Yeah. And I think that is the last one. Oh, what a realization. So kind of a weird one to end The last on. one, yes, it is. <laughs> well, guys, I hope uh, you got uh, some information today. I'm happy to hear from you guys about everything that we discussed. Drop your thoughts in the comments down below. As I said, as a Nickelodeon and, you know, Disney kid, I used to watch all these different shows and stuff. It's very interesting to see how these uh, people turn out. Of course, this focuses on uh, Nickelodeon. I have no idea if anything like this happened at uh, Disney, so I cannot speak to that. But it's just so interesting to watch these uh, kids shows that uh, you watched as a kid and, and go back and understand things that you didn't understand at the time. And I, I found myself wondering, how, what what is the degree of harm in, in that? Do we get some sort of subliminal conditioning as children when we watch things like that? Seemingly so. I, I would imagine that's the case. Or is it some sort of innocuous thing that only adults understand and it goes over kids' heads and it doesn't matter? I don't know. It, it, the, the feeling that it gave me watching it signals to me that maybe kids shouldn't watch it, but I can only say that from the perspective of being an adult. So it's a, it's a tough thing to analyze and come to a conclusion on. I do see we got another super chat here from Millie. It says, producers notoriously target the most vulnerable. My sis was hospitalized for an eating disorder and producers wanted to film a show off the patients. Seems like exploitation to me. Thank God it never aired. Yeah, 100%. 100% or they... Uh, Predators and even Hollywood can often go after very, very vulnerable people. It's easier to manipulate. It's easier to get whatever it is that you want out of somebody who is vulnerable. Now, guys, again, drop your thoughts in the comments down below. Let me know how you feel about the different subject matters we discussed today and your thoughts on the documentary, Quiet on Set. And if you haven't watched it, it's on Max. You guys can check it out. I believe it's four episodes and no more than that. And then you can come back and give me your thoughts. It will be reading through your comments. As always, if you disagree with me, duke it out, but do so respectfully. And if you like this video, like, subscribe. Click the notification bell to be notified every single time we go live, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Oh, no, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Plus, we mm. post videos for you guys every single day. Tomorrow's video is about woke Star Wars, which apparently is coming to a TV near you. On that note, guys, I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>